electronic engineering, telecommunications, and heritage means different things to us than uh, perhaps that we've looked at so far. Um, so let me start with something brand spanking new. This is the Hitachi Class 800 train, which is on test on British Railways at the moment. And there is a direct line, if you pardon the pun, from that to Stevenson's rocket, which is on display at the Science Industry Museum in Manchester. These two were developed for the same purpose, the transportation of people. Yet, there's 188 years between them. When Stevenson's rocket was on trial in 1829, and the Hitachi Class 800 started trials last year. But, the tracks on which they run are still four foot eight and a half inches apart. If you brought George and Robert Stevenson back, they would recognise those tracks and know what they are. Yes, we've gone from fish plates to continuously welded rails. Yes, we've gone from manual signalling to computer automated systems. We've got track uh, collision avoidance, warning systems on board the trains. The technology's improved, but fundamentally, those tracks are still the same as they were when George Stevenson and Robert Stevenson were developing rocket. Now let me give you the same analogy in my area. This is the Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus smartphone. Marketed today, it was launched this year, smartphone. Stevenson's rocket is the Panasonic VM1. But this is the difference. Our Stevenson's rocket, the Panasonic VM1, was designed to make phone calls. The Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus is marketed on the quality of its camera. It is not used primarily for the purpose that the Panasonic VM1 was used for. If you look at the marketing of the Samsung smartphone, it's about the camera, it's about the screen, it's about the internet connection, it's about the apps which you can run on it. And you go on the long list and at the bottom it says, and it makes phone calls. But this is the other difference. There's only 33 years between those two. Now when I suggested if you brought Robert and George Stevenson back and they would see the tracks, what have we done to the tracks on the mobile phone? Well in those 33 years, we created four different designs, starting with the original, what we call ETAX, moving on to GSM, 3G and 4G. The Panasonic VM1 will not work today because it was designed on the first generation. So unlike Stevenson's rocket, which would run on today's tracks, the Panasonic VM1 won't work anymore. If you brought back the designers, I don't think they're dead by the way, but if you ask the designers of the VM1 to look at the modern 4G network, it is radically different to what they were familiar with. And here's the really interesting bit. Next year, we launch 5G. So in 34 years, we will have created five generations of mobile phone networks. And the usage is radically different to what it was. And our time scale for that was 34 years. So the 33-year-old Panasonic VM1, which by the way, is the phone that launched the mobile phone in this country. The Panasonic VM1 is, was used by Ernie Wise of Morgan and Wise fame to launch Vodafone on the 1st of January, 1985, the launch of the mobile phone in this country. The first generation of mobile phone network launched in 85 has been totally decommissioned as of 2001. It's gone. It's lost. 
The 188-year-old Stephen to drop it, if you could make it steam again, it would still run on today's tracks. And here's the real interesting thing. The archival record of Stevenson's rocket is infinitely richer and more detailed and complete than the Panasonic VM1. It's almost impossible to find information about it. In fact, this is one of only three photographs that I'm aware of that have been either survived or taken, and I don't know which, of the launch of the mobile phone in the UK. And this was taken at St Catherine's Dock in London on the 1st of January 1985. Ernie Wise is holding in his hand a Panasonic VM1. And the effort we went to to prove that that was the case is unbelievable. When Vodafone was celebrating their 30th anniversary, they came to me for advice about their history, because they have no archive. I supplied from the University of Salford collection mobile phones, which they then used as part of a national exhibition that they took around Vodafone shops. They had no record. Sadly, we don't have a Panasonic VM1. If anyone has one in their lot, then I'm certainly in the market for them. The timescales are very short. And the networks change. So this is a two-year uh, gap. The network on the left is a cellular base station. It's on an industrial park not far from here, taken by my colleague Andy Sutton. And two years later, you might think, well, has it changed? Well, there are differences there. And they're mainly down there at the bottom. Because what's happened, this was a 2G, 3G network, which has been upgraded with a higher capacity connection and it's being upgraded to 4G as well. And what's happened is we're seeing changes to the infrastructure at the bottom. So the records of the original position have gone and that is what it looks like now. The tower and the antennas which are in that top enclosure are actually the same, but you wouldn't know that. So changes occur to our infrastructure without necessarily them being spotted or appreciated and understood. The network is evolving, it's not a static thing. And it's disappearing as well. The photograph on the left shows you a cell tower that's now gone. Or here, this, you might think, oh, they're busily erecting the new cell site here. No, they're not. They're demolishing them. So they've already removed all of the antennas up here that create the mobile phone signal. This, in, this sort of structure, which held everything in place, is in the process of itself being demolished. So the network is being changed, and it is being removed. We are losing. It's being erased from our network from the network has been raised for various reasons to do with upgrade, but also to do with company mergers. When Orange and T-Mobile merged to create EE, they had double infrastructure. So inevitably, there was an amalgamation and merging and a removal of infrastructure. Has any of that been documented? Probably not. The UK mobile phone industry is commercial companies. Commercial companies focused on today and tomorrow, not yesterday. Already mentioned that Vodafone, when they were celebrating the 30th anniversary, hadn't got an archive. With the exception of one exhibit in the Information Age Gallery and Science Museum in London, the first generation of mobile phone network in this country has basically already been lost. It's gone, uh, eradicated. But many of the physical sites remain. It's just been repurposed. So a cell site today that is providing your 4G connection to your smartphone was possibly a site that was there when the mobile phone was launched, but it looks nothing like it did back in 85. 
Things get repurposed and reused for the infrastructure. Mobile technology, I think we all understand, it's had a transformational impact on us, on society, yet the archival record of that is scant, and that's being generous. And it's a short time scale. It's 33 year time scale in this country. And we've already lost, probably because it was never recorded, uh, the archival records of that period of technology. Let's look at something different. In 1968, this phone box was hailed as a masterpiece of industrial design. It was designed by Bruce Martin, and it was designed because the feeling was we needed a phone box that represented contemporary architecture and the modern concrete town centres. And this is what was designed. It was the eighth design of phone box and so it's known as kiosk K number eight, the K8, by Bruce Martin. From 1968, it became Britain's standard phone box. So whenever a new phone box was required or an existing one had to be replaced, it was the K8 shown here that was used. And 11,000 of those ultimately were manufactured and installed around the country. It was the standard red phone box from 1968 onwards. But in 1985, the newly privatised British Telecom decided that as a private industry, we have to have a new image. And part of that new image, which also involved the paint schemes on vehicles and logos and all of those normal things, Part of that image change was the phone box. And they produced this report, pay phones for the 21st century, and they put 160 million pounds to revitalize and modernize the UK's phone box infrastructure. The number of phone boxes in this country almost doubled under privatization. There was a concept that they got rid of them all, they didn't. Uh, phone box population actually doubled under privatized, the early years of privatization. This new range was known as the KX range. We see it around today. Um, architecturally, it was utility. It wasn't um, exquisite. Uh, it was very functional. Uh, it didn't need repainting red every couple of years, so maintenance costs were a key factor. British Telecom wanted a modern image a commercial company wanted an infrastructure which they could main, maintain cost-effectively. That was a driver, commercial company. The consequence of payphones for the 21st century was we're going to get rid of the existing stock and create put these new ones in place. So we're going to get rid of the really ancient 64-year-old K1, the first design, Chaos 1, including, or it right up to, the 17-year-old K8. So get rid of the whole stock, put these new ones in place, that's the plan. Inevitably, the heritage movement was incensed. And under the 30 Society began this campaign, which called the British Telephone Box, Take It As Red. And a national campaign started to designate kiosks as important miniature buildings of special architectural or historic interest. You think about the archetypal English village. What's it got? A duck pond, a pub, a church, and probably a red phone box. The focus of the heritage movement was on the older designs, particularly those of Gilbert Scott, 
We have a K2 and a K6, and his K3. But the outer two are the two that perhaps were the ones that people focused on. That's the British phone box that had to be preserved. And that's what the heritage movement went full tilt at to protect against this awful British telecom who wanted to get rid of them and replace them with these aluminium monstrosities. However, <coughs> there were problems. <coughs> the preservation laws only allowed you to only allowed at that time, 85, to list objects which were predating 1940. Now, today it's the 30 year rule. But back then it had to be before, essentially before the Second World War. Well, you could do some of those phone boxes on that basis. But there's another key word, in an unaltered state. They have to be in their original state. The 30th Society said, look, that really, we should have a different view here. What we should care about is the contribution the phone box makes to its surroundings. That's what really should determine whether we list it and preserve it or not. Gavin Stamp, a leading light of the 30th Society, actually said, we didn't fully appreciate the need to protect examples of the K8. They simply seem too new and too numerous to warrant our concern. British Telecom now wanted to get rid of these old phone boxes that they felt were reflective of their image and were expensive to maintain, took a path of least resistance. If the heritage movement is getting exercised about the Gilbert Scott red phone boxes and giving BT grief as it's trying to replace them. But the heritage movement are powerless to do anything about the K8, launched in 1968, way past 1940. There's nothing the heritage and the heritage movement, as Gary Stapp says, weren't even thinking about the K8. BT took the path of least resistance, swiped the K8s out of the way, and they were virtually wiped off the face of the country. There's less than 1% today. And this shows you how a commercial company wants to modernise and move forward, and in many ways the heritage movement is not looking in the right place, because they're looking at something which is far too young, it's only 17 years old, surely that's not heritage. The laws don't help and suddenly it's removed. Old, in telecommunications terms, actually, in some of parts of telecommunications, we can measure it in months. And here's an example. The Apple iPhone was launched in 2007. Since the launch, there have been 16 different models of that phone produced. That's more than it's at least one a year. Today, Apple, the company, regard anything older than the Apple iPhone 5S of 2013 as junk. They don't support it. It's junk. So they're not even interested in anything that's older than the 2013 Apple iPhone 5S. So again, we're losing, the, the industry is not interested in its own heritage in that sense. There is a bit of a market out there, the second hand market for an original iPhone. Um, people are, the collectors out there are trying to collect the object to say to have to, they've got an original iPhone. But the industry so focused on the big events which are the launch of their next phone is so obsessed by the next model that the heritage of where they've come from is simply not being recorded. The exception is BT, because BT started life as a general post office and it has an archive, a world-class archive, 
and they are obligated to preserve that archive. Up to privatisation. Post-privatisation, it's their decision as to whether they add to that archive. Now, I happen to work very closely with BT Archives, and I know they work hard to maintain the currency of that archive. Pre-1985, it is fantastic, going right back to the earliest days of the telephone service and telegraphy in the UK. But even British Telecom aren't required to keep adding to that archive, it's purely out of the corporate responsibility that they've taken on. My experience of the mobile industry, they don't even have that. Infrastructure can change significantly without the casual observer noticing it. So change is happening all around us and in many ways it's not being recorded except for one person I know who can't be here today and that's my colleague Andy Sutton who has an archive of photographs of all of these sites. His day job is to design mobile phone networks so he has a passion not only for tomorrow but also yesterday which is very unusual. Uh, and he does take an interest in these things, but in essence, the industry doesn't. And one of the problems is technological change is too quick for nostalgia. And what I mean by that is you don't have long enough to be with a piece of technology to create an attachment to it before it's out the window and the next one is replaced. It. In many ways, heritage doesn't really do justice in telecoms because we need another word that talks about recognising the importance of something before we've lost its history. Trying to find information about the launch of the mobile phone in January 1985 is hard work. And that's not very long ago. And so the concern we have, you fast forward to the TAC conference in 50 years' time, Anybody then who wants to research the birth of the mobile phone in this country is going to have one hell of a job because there won't be the archival record there to call it. And we are eroding that archival record for future generations of archaeologists. So there's no there won't be an archive there because it's not being built. Can we do anything? Well, by the time we recognise the historical importance of technology, it's generally too late. <coughs> it's already gone. We need to try and move telecommunications up the heritage agenda in order to, in many ways, open the eyes of the heritage movement to say that just like transport is important, telecommunications today is a vital part of society. As any O2 customers will know from a week or so ago when you were disconnected from the internet. Loss of communication was a national media event. So much ingrained in society that we don't have necessarily the heritage eye on that particular technology. Preservation policies need updating, so we need to think about the shorter time scales and the concern of technological obsolescence. We need to be a lot more agile in contemporary collecting. Now we work very closely with a number of museums under what's called the Connected Earth Partnership that have galleries of telecommunications and contemporary collecting is a big challenge for them because they say we don't know what we need to collect today because we don't know the change processes that are coming. And by the time we've worked out what they are, what we wanted to preserve is already being skipped. And that's a real challenge. So the other side of the coin is we need to try and work with the telecoms industry to say, well, look, can we somehow have a heads up into the heritage movement about the changes that are coming so that if the telecoms industry don't want to do the job and preserve things, they can help the heritage movement do what they want to do. So it's this kind of relationship that we need to try and develop 
and, and, and get working. Otherwise, we're losing a significant part of our heritage on telecommunications. So I'll leave you with the contact details myself um, at the University of Salford. Um, if you want to send me an email, please do. My colleague, Andy Sutton, is one of my university professors at Salford. Now he's more than happy for you to email him. Uh, and that's the website we maintain, which has got various articles on there we've written about the telecom heritage. We're trying to do our bit. Um, we are, we're trying to practice what we're preaching here. We're both working on tomorrow for the industry. We're both doing research on tomorrow's technologies, but we both have an interest and a passion for not forgetting the heritage. And uh, I, I think we need to try and do our bit to try and get telecoms recognised as a, an area, but to recognise that the pace of change is a real challenge for us. Thank you. Bye.